I think something that I would always say to all my children, my family is never forget your past and always be normal of what you are rather than whether the house you live in or the car you drive or the holidays you have. It's really being yourself. And, and that's something that I'm really, really proud of, not just myself, but my family, my children, my lovely wife, Sunita. I think that's really what I will take with me from this planet, that my family always kept their feet on the ground. Welcome to the Global Indian Podcast, home to the greatest conversations and the official platform for people of Indian origin. Yes, let's face it, we are everywhere. Thank you for clicking the link and thank you for finding out more about this remarkable conversation. Now, you know, every single week we plunge into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin. Take a second look at those countries we now call home and tackle the big conversations we have to have. Now, in this episode, we get to meet with the wonderful Sarinda Aurora. Now, to put in perspective, if you've ever traveled into London by Heathrow Airport, I don't know, that feels like many years ago with the whole COVID situation, but do bear with me. If you've ever traveled in, chances are you would have sat or been to one of his hotels. Now, the fact is, Sarinda's Hotels, Aurora Group, really are at the cutting edge of British tourism. They pretty much are a national treasure in themselves. But how much do we know about the man behind the business? And that's where we plunge in today. Not only does Sarinda tell us the tips and techniques he needs every entrepreneur to know, just also including notions of identity, but remaining grounded, which is vitally important. But he also plunges into what's it like to be him and the big questions that are asked at this moment in time. Now, if you like what we do and you want to get involved, it couldn't be easier. Simply visit our new looking site at theglobalindianseries.com where you can see the entire repertoire of conversations we've had so far from around our 50 Shades of Grand home. Also, you can submit your stories because we'd love to hear from you because ultimately we are building the world's living and first encyclopedia that looks at people like us. I'd also like to thank our supporters and sponsors, some of which you're going to hear from shortly. I truly hope you enjoy this remarkable conversation. Hello, my name is Daniel Traça and I'm the Nova, Nova School of Business and Economics in Carcavelos, Portugal, one of Europe's leading business schools. I'm proud to be of Indian origin and I invite you to discover this podcast which will look to redefine the impact that Indians and their descendants are doing all over the world. In behalf of Nova School of Business and Economics, I wish you a great 2021. My name is Chitra Stern, and I am a proud Global Indian Ambassador and CEO of Martignal Resorts and Martignal Residences. We pride ourselves on the journeys that define a community, and our developments bring people together. Did you know that over 70,000 people just like us call Portugal home? The Global Indian Journey has brought people together in a meaningful way. And on behalf of all of us at Martignal, we want to thank you for joining us in these remarkable conversations. We look forward to seeing you here in Lisbon post-COVID. Have a great day. And just move. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was living in India with, I thought, with my parents. Um, and I was assuming I was coming to London to educate and study and uh, live with my uncle and aunt. And yet when I came to Heathrow in 72, I actually then found out a few days later uh, that actually my real parents were here. Then I kind of consoled myself and said, well, feel lucky, surrender. You've got two mums and two dads. So I've got mom and dad in India who I spent the first 13 and a half years with, and I've got mom and dad here. So it was interesting, see coming straight from Heathrow to Southall, uh, where a lot of the Asian families were, and it's like being in little India, but um, being there with the, with the family, uh, it was a, you know, how do you want to say, pick up quickly. Uh, and that's the one thing I do say, Rajan, that, uh, the best thing I find about the UK is, compared to so many other countries around the world, 
here, if you want to work hard and achieve something, it is possible. If I can do it, then anyone can do it. And I, I would say that, uh, the, you know, the, of course you have to have dreams before you can turn them into reality. No good sitting there and saying, well, I'm actually going to do this or do that and not really have any vision or dreams or ideas. So that's really where I guess I find the best thing in the UK. You want to work hard, you're treated fairly. Of course, in the 70s and 80s, you're too young to remember, but you were not even here at that time, but at least, um, it, you know, people in those days would say, oh, there's racism, or because of my color, I can't yeah. get a job. And I think uh, the, the one thing I've always said in life, why do we look at problems? Let's look at solutions. Why do you want to sit there and just keep mourning and winding yourself up and saying, oh, because of my race, my color, and my background, I can't get a job or I can't get the job I want. I can't do the business I want to do because of my color. I think let's actually find solutions, reasons how we can do things. Yeah. And from that perspective, I found the UK to be uh, a very fair place on the planet. Of course, sometimes you have to work harder than your next door neighbor or your friends. Uh, but I, I really found that kind of thing pretty easy to uh, get around. Do you think we often use identity as a mask to say to justify us not actually doing enough? Do you think that's part and parcel of it? Yes. Like how, yeah. Go on, sorry. I was, I was going to say, what, what does identity mean to you then in that vice? Well, I, I just always say that we're all human beings. We all normal. Forget the shape, the color, the size. We're all human beings and we're all equal. Um, again, right down to religion. You know, people yeah. will say, oh, you know, whether you're Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Christian. You know, to me, God is one. I've always, uh, you know, if we went to a Hindu temple or Sikh temple or a church, really God is one. It's how we... Um, sort of take ourselves into life and saying, you know, whether it's prayers, whether it's religion, you know, to me, we're all same, equal, him and you. And that's why I've always said, Raj, in my book, in my world, um, whether I've got a friend from my school days and whether I'm sitting next to a millionaire or a billionaire, they're all human beings. It Absolutely. Doesn't and I think that's the, that's the most, you know, I, do, I have seen along my journey, some having made a few bob, a few pennies, they just forget the past and the world. And I think that's, what, um, I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but in my book, I wouldn't do that because at the end of the day, you know, we all come with nothing and we go with nothing. That's the Absolutely. most important. Do, do you think as a community, we have a really strange fascination with wealth then? Because you often see that with some of the generations that come in, all of a sudden we substitute this value of community spirit of, one another going through the whole process to owning Mercedes Benz or who owns the most houses? Do you know, you, you could say that, but I would say uh, personally, I, I wouldn't totally agree with that because I think mm. it's a community thing. You know, look, to me, every country, every community, you have a good and bad. You, you always have, you know, you have the odd bad apple that will ruin it for the others or give them a bad name. Uh, the one thing for sure about the Asian community our background, people are hardworking, have always mm -hmm. been, uh, came to the 70s. You know, my mom used to work uh, daytime in a factory, evening she, she'll come home, cook for the family, yeah. and she in the evening, a weekend, she, again, she had a weekend job, so poor thing, she was working seven days a week. So, you know, in life, you know, not everyone, not every Indian wants to work seven days a week, or Asian want to work seven days a week. You know, we have a choice. Um, you know, there are lots of people who will say, I want my hubby at home six o'clock in the evening. I don't want my partner to be away for the weekend. You know, one the, so it's, and it doesn't necessarily make you happy, just the millions or a uh, bit of money into your bank account or in your cars. I know in the olden days, it used to be when I first came, the Asians, oh, let's buy Nissan, let's buy Datsun, or let's buy Mercedes. You know, that's a yeah. sort of, I don't think, I think, you know, you have people in the Western culture, in African culture, in the Asian culture, people are ambitious, they want to achieve something. So from that perspective, I would say, of course, you know, the one thing as an Asian, I mean, I've always said, and I make no apology on this, you never forget your past. You know, 
I was born in India, you know, it's in my blood, my family, my, um, at the end of the day, the one thing I am proud to say that if you look from the Asian world, if you look at how many heads uh, of the multinationals around the world, now whether you look at Google, whether you're looking at the banking world, how many of those, the top guys and girls are Asians? But you know, it doesn't just come on a plate. Uh, you have to work for it. That's one thing we have had as, as, as our Asian background, that people are proud to work together. People are proud to support their families and friends. And that's what really does make us special. Now that doesn't mean to say, oh, there's no Westerners or Africans that don't actually do that for their families or friends. Maybe probably percent our culture maybe we know more because we know lots of other asians friends and families yeah. i think it's just getting that right balance no i agree i think it is a human touch we forget that we are all the same aren't we we're all the same species and as you rightly said it's it doesn't matter about how much money you got or how little you got it doesn't take away from the human integrity of what you're becoming now on, on that notion now, what do you class as Indianness then? How do you define this thing? Because you, you left India many years ago, only 30 years ago, if I go in the way that you look. You oh, know. that's the camera. Um, <laughs> well, it's just the, the culture, the family, not just the food. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's really, uh, I, I see the closeness around my own children, uh, my own grandchildren. Um, as an example, Sanjay, my son, five years ago, he got married, or just under five years ago, he got married. And a couple of years ago, we were talking, and we still live together. You know, father and son, with both our wives, and now he's got a uh, beautiful son, our, our grandson, and we still live together. And I remember saying to Sanjay Raj a couple of years ago, guys, you know, if you're going to go to London, maybe go to the same place. And they both said, and my own daughter-in-law, Raj, said, no, mom, dad, we like living together. It's great to be together. And I think that's really, to me, we're not forcing each other. I mean, in this day and age, uh, I say I'm, I'm very blessed. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily make, you know, there are a lot of uh, Westerner friends who look after their parents or their families. So I think that's really, for me, having that closeness in the family is the way I was brought up. Uh, you know, I spent 13 and a half years in India and I've now been in England for 48 years. I still go back every year. I still have my, my brother, my sister. So I, I think it's just that close. And I still have my, uh, my best friend, two of my best friends from school. I still my best friends after 48 years. And I think that it's really, uh, it's those kind of moments that I cherish and say, you know, it's, uh, important in my book, in my world, is never forget your past. Uh, so my good old mom used to say, your son, don't ever just run up the ladder or look at the sky because if you run up the ladder and you miss a step and you come down like a ton of bricks, you may not get up again. So yeah. she said, go a step up, but also keep looking step behind. And I remember asking, I said, why are you saying this? And well, if you look step ahead, you'll always remain ambitious. If you look step behind, you'll never forget your past. And it's just keeping that right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, do people have a misconception about you? Because are you known as the Asian billionaire first before surrender? You know, how, how, do, pe how do you think that the general public look at you? Because we speak, and you're incredibly down to earth. There's no pompousness, there's no airs or graces. It's a human being to human being. But do you think the average person, when they would look, what do you think that their perceptions are? I, that would really break my heart if I'm just known for, oh, well, he's got a few pennies, you know, he's, uh, he's made it. I think I always want to be seen and known as Surinder. Uh, I just don't want to, it, it, honestly, it is not relevant. I mean, I know lots of friends who are so happy, they just live average, normal life, what I call normal life. And yeah. then I know a lot of people with wealth and there are so many unhappy people. You know, it may look rosy, it may look amazing on the face of it, 
if you dig in or if you see behind or if you know behind and people are so unhappy, does money actually make you happy or do you really think things? No. I've always said in life, uh, different people are driven with different things. Mm. Uh, just as an example, uh, one of my friends, a uh, working colleague um, who I've known for nearly 20 years, uh, English guy, his mum passed away a couple of years ago. He's only early 50s, 51, 52. And he rang me a couple of months ago and said, I'm leaving work. I can live comfortably. But I'm going to take at least two years sabbatical. And he said, my, he lost his mum, youngish age, but he said, I want to, I've made a promise with my mum that I'm never just going to keep working. He can live comfortably. Now, that's amazing to do that and just say, you know, it's not a question of, I can live comfortably of my family, wife, kids. So not everyone is, should be driven by money. I think, you know, I've always said money, you know, is such that if you haven't got money, you've got problems. And if you've got money, you've got more problems. So it's yeah. just getting the right balance. Imagine that, uh, I think, and some people with the right balance be very happy in a flat or a three bedroom house or two bedroom house. And some people may not be happy in a great big mansion. So, you know, from my perspective, I've always been asked, uh, oh, you know, what's your agenda? And I remember being asked uh, in one of our board meetings a few years ago, well, we made it to, um, assets of billion and a half, how are we going to get to two billion? And I remember saying in that board meeting, you know, look, I don't have those ambitions and dreams that you need to be somewhere on the rich list, or you need to be somewhere on, uh, on, on identity, you know, from a uh, money perspective or business perspective. I do get driven by deals. I, you know, that's the excitement. Uh, you know, pray to God, touch wood, I could have given up work 10 years ago, five years ago. Uh, not having to work through, um, but it's, it's actually, I, I want to keep my brain ticking. And yeah. that's why she said to me, you know, a few years ago, when are you going to retire? What are your plans? And I said, honey, I don't really want to retire. Uh, I enjoy working. Yeah. What I want to do is get the right balance in life. So I just mentioned, um, just before we started uh, speaking on the interview, Rajan, that I've just been away a five and a half week vacation. I'd never done that in my life. Um, I go away again next month for another three or four weeks. Uh, so I just want to make sure I get the right balance. I want to spend time with my dear Sunita. I do want to spend time with my grandkids. I do want to go and play a bit more golf. I do want to travel a bit more. In fact, only this weekend, I was saying to Sunita, why don't we have our nasty food? Why don't we actually have our own bucket list? Do we yeah. want to go? Japan, do you want to go to Australia, do you want to go to Hawaii, whatever we want to do. Uh, so it's not really, we want to actually say, shut shop, move on, I don't want to be in, in the office. Uh, no, I never want to do that because I do enjoy my people, my employees, my colleagues, uh, they're part of the family and, and that's something I never want to walk away from. As long as I can get the right balance, Rajan. I don't want yeah. to do what years ago. I mean, the first 15 years of my marriage, Sunita and I only had two family holidays in 15 years. Yeah. I used to be working seven days a week from 6.30, 6 o'clock in the morning till 11 p.m. Uh, do I want to continue doing that? Absolutely not. So it's just getting that right balance. Yeah, is what, what would you then, what drove you? Because it seems like everything that you've done has just been a natural extension of your own purpose or passion. When you started buying houses, it wasn't for the fact of that, it was just excitement. It seems that actually here's a project that I can do, I can build it up with the hotels. It's, it's an excitement to say, okay, what's possible? The fact that money's not the driver is really interesting. What drives you now then? And, you know, the reality is this experience of life, no matter how long it is, is always going to feel short. What are the yeah. things that you'd wish that the next generation could learn from your experiences? Well, you know, it's just getting the right balance in life. And I think what drives me, I still love the excitement of doing a deal. Now, doing a deal, it could be 
building a new building. It could be refurbing. It could be running a new build, uh, running a hotel. I mean, we, we're opening uh, Easter next Easter in 21. We're going to be building our flagship uh, on the edge of Windsor Great Park. We are going to be opening a, a Fairmont. Now that's going to be the very top end, something we've never built to that. You know, in the past, I've obviously built my other flagships like the Sofitel at T5, or the Intercontinental at the O2. I mean, they really sort of, you talk about five-star product, but Fairmont just takes it to the next level. So, so what, but what excites you about that? Is it the bricks and mortar or is it the impact that you think that's going to have? Well, do you know, uh, my, my CFO said to me a few years ago, Surinder, people would see you as a property or do they see you as a property company? Do they see you as a hotelier or do they see you as a developer? Yeah. And if I step back and I look at it and think, actually, I love three businesses. I love hotels. I love construction because that comes with a lot of hassles, a lot of challenges. Um, you know, con some of the contractors can go bust. Uh, you can get delays. You can get leaks. You can get yeah. roofs flying off. You know, if things happening. Um, I love property. I love bricks and mortar. And you know, I'm very. I've always been very open about it, Rajan. That this is where I'm so different with my son Sanjay. Uh, I've always said I'm. Um, I never really had huge plans, even when I was 18, 20, working for British Airways. I would take life as it comes, but if I see an opportunity, and in life, it's all about risk and reward. Mm. Some people will go kamikaze, and that to me is, well, let me go and take a jump from the fifth or eighth floor of the building, because the bigger the risk, the bigger the I would never do a uh, risk and reward on those bases. I will say, well, can I go and jump from the first to the second floor? And will I have a chance of surviving if my plan doesn't work? Well, you know, I might walk away with a broken arm or a broken leg. But I know I'll live and maybe I'm, that's a risk and reward I'm prepared to take. Um, so it, it's just getting the right so you, you don't get high on the deals, you get a high, you get excited by the fact that I can build something, I can take an idea from my mindset and yeah. bring it into physical form, which is really, really interesting. I suppose the other thing to make you even more human, what have been your biggest fears, despite business? You know, what have been your biggest fears whilst you've been here? Well, uh, if, for me, I'll just come back to that and I'm just going to finish off with the, uh, the I am an opportunist, whereas Sanjay, my son, is very much a strategist. Yeah. You know, he wants to have a five-year plan, two-year plan, 10-year plan. You know, he's been in the business for nearly five years now and doing incredibly well. I'm so proud of him, although I'll never say it on his face. Uh, but, you know, he, since he, I, I used to say to Sunita that he is going to be better than his dad. Now, but we're very different. So, you know, it doesn't mean to say, I don't care about my business or my people. Uh, he, you know, we're both, very much the same so I think that's something uh, to kind of it doesn't there's nothing wrong or right about it if one is more of a strategist the other one's more of an opportunist but we, we still look at deals and we look at stuff together um, and you know as he comes more into the business I can start stepping back a little bit more but I'll always be here and he always laughs and says dad you're never going to retire even at the age of 80 uh, but I, you know we both love work we're both very passionate yeah, no, I can see it. it's, it's definitely a parrot on that side. So, like, what, what are your biggest fears then? Are you a man that has any fears? Yeah, no, look, we all have fears. We all have, of course, uh, I, I've gone past, you know, once you go past the 5 0 and then the 6 0, God up there always make, changes your batteries to Duracell. <laughs> batteries are going faster so you never really worry about getting old or we're all going to leave this planet one day um, but I think my biggest fear from a business perspective Rajan, you know I've now lived through uh, a few different cycles in life yeah. and most important thing I would say to any answer anyone in life life is never rosy life is never if I just drew a line uphill and just said that's life I'm going to just keep going up all the time. I've always said life is valleys and hills. And of course, you're going to have good times. You're going to have bad times. 
in my book, some people think that they are real winners when they're on top of the hill. But the real winners in life, in my world, in my book, mm. are down in the valleys. Because once you're down in the valleys and you wake up and push yourself up the hill, those are the real winners. So, you know, I had a big, obviously, uh, knock back in 2001 with 9-11. I was just opening my new hotel in Gatwick, Crawley, and the whole world was in crisis. Then we had the 7-7 and 2008 crisis. Uh, that was so bad. Um, and, you know, and I've always said in life, don't ever be scared of making mistakes. Just never repeat them. Learn yeah. from them. I still make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We just keep learning from them. So in 2008, 9, 10, we had real crises as an organization. Uh, the banks were breathing down the neck. And that's the other thing I will say, nothing bad about the banks, but I will say to it, anyone listening, that the banks will always be there with an umbrella over your head when the sun is shining. So when you need them, sadly, the banks, you know, they run a business, they have their shareholders, their team, and they need to justify their existence. So they've got to run their business. Um, but, you know, so in 2008, I learned that lesson from 2008, 10, 11, 12. And I kind of said to myself, well, in future, I hope and pray that I never, ever, I'm on the, just the beck and call of the lenders. Because yeah. we need, you can't be disrespectful to the lenders. You need to look at it from their point of view. They are your stakeholders. If someone's lending you lots of money, they are your partners, stakeholders. And you need to be respectful to give them their money back. So it's just that partnership again. So how can I do that? Well, I'm going to make sure, and this was my thinking after 2008 crisis, how can I deleverage, re, you know, de-gear so I'm not highly leveraged? You know, in the olden days, I could be leveraged to 70, 75%. So the only way I can do that is if I can get my gearing down, well, what do I think the reasonable number should be is? And thankfully, pray to God, touch your wood, we leveraged down to sort of circa below 30. And that's where I've been a little bit more, uh, no one's been comfortable in these crises we we are currently in, but I can at least go home and sleep, unlike 2008, 9, 10. Yeah. Uh, so it is so tough. It has been tough. I personally believe we've, you know, and you know, it's great that we, we can see some ray of hope with the vaccines, and hopefully things getting. Uh, I think it still would be two or three years before we get to break COVID. I think people forget the human experience of it because you're in a sector that is massively impacted by travel by COVID. So you got people that will be laid off, undoubtedly because of profits and everything else is there. And that's, lo that's livelihoods that you're dealing with on that yeah. side. And then the other flip side is that you're so grounded in this human form that you also realize what's it like to be them because you were once there. You know, when you arrive in the UK, when you're working in the bank and then you went into property, how do you deal with it? Forget about the economic parts. How do you deal with it emotionally going through this process, knowing that every decision you take has a human consequence? Yeah, look, you know, of course it does. And I think you, you've got to sometimes, in life, the odd time you do something from your heart. Yeah. But you've got to see if you hadn't think, you know, I've always tried to be reasonable and fair in my world, in my head. Yeah. And sometimes the other side, the person on the other side of the fence may think, no, you're being a right bastard or you're being, you know. I mean, this is the first time, Rajan, in these crises, this is so unprecedented crisis yeah. with in and for the first time in my life we've actually had to lay people off now something that i've always used the words that we are a family so i've had over two and a half thousand staff members as part of my family but then you know i've had to look at it and say well actually if we don't do something about it yeah none of us will be here yeah so uh, the example the example I've been giving, I gave to my senior team back in March, April, that we're facing these unprecedented crises. If you just imagine we're on a boat in the middle of the sea, deep ocean, hmm. and 
that unless we do something about it, we all got to sink. And, you know, so sometimes you got to leave your emotions behind and, you yeah. know, you, and, you know, the other, the other side I've always said, you know, in life, um, life is a two way traffic. Uh, I, you or I, no one can clap with one hand. So when I call my staff, my two and a half thousand people and say, you're my family, I need them to give me their hundred percent. And if they don't give me their hundred percent, then I'm sorry, I'm not family. You know, I can't go to my bankers and say, well, you know what? I haven't cleaned the rooms and let the rooms or haven't built yeah. the building. My family, my people have let me down. So, you know, during these crises, what's been incredible. And, you know, I had um, uh, my general manager from the Sofitel at T5 yesterday saying, well, you know, obviously we, we're working with minimum amount of staff because it is so tough and our industry is so badly hit. You know, our the travel tourism, the airlines, uh, the hotels, restaurants, bars, we're the worst hit. And he said, you won't believe it, boss. I've got a few of the staff who've just turned up voluntarily just to put the Christmas decorations up in their own time. The days off or, you know, and you know, I had the same thing from my general manager at the O2 a couple of weeks ago saying, I've got staff just coming in saying, can we just help? Uh, even if it means just watering the uh, the lawn outside the garden or something, can we just help in our own spare time? Um, so those are the kind of family members you. I, I so I think you got a fourth level of your business that you haven't think thought. Then you got the real estate, you got the construction, but then you got the experiential part of it because you're giving people an experience, aren't you? It's and also meaning for those family members that you have there. Yeah. So I th I think you know that, that thing of two way traffic. Yeah. Um, if I want these guys and girls to be part of my family, they've got to give me their hundred percent. But if I want them to respect me, I also have to respect them as well. So Absolutely. If, that, if you don't have that relationship, you know. We're, uh, we're talking of relations, and Sarindo, you entered the world of politics to make a difference. I know that you're you're part of the Labour Party. Is that correct? Uh, no, I, I would say. Um, I, you know, when I came from India in 72, yeah. I wouldn't just say just mom, but majority of the Asian community, or a big percentage, whether that percentage was 80% or 70% or 90%, but big percentage of the Asian community, working class, used to be labor. Yeah. Uh, as I've grown up, and, and I wouldn't say, well, I've actually jumped ship, and I'm, I'm in conservative camp from Lib Dems or... Yeah. I'm in a labor camp, nothing. I'm actually, to me, I have never really got into politics as such. I don't want to, I think politics is so tough. And when you look at any politician, you know, we obviously look at the uh, the likes of Rishi Sunak and Priti Patel and uh, a lot of other, Alok Sharma and others. Uh, some of the guys have actually given up a lot in their yeah. normal life actually get into politics now that's the one thing i never could and never will do because i just i couldn't do it so over the years when people have said to me so surinder um tell me about your politic interests um i remember meeting gosh it must be nearly over 15 18 years ago tony blair yeah. uh, I, met, I met him through cliff richard because cliff is like family and Cliff and Tony used to play tennis together. And when I met, and he was at PM at that time, and I remember Tony saying to me, so Surinder, what are your views on politics? And I said, uh, Tony, I don't do politics. I'm not into politics at all. And then about 10 years ago, I met uh, Philip Hammond, who was yeah. a chancellor. Philip was my local member, uh, my MP. And the first time we met over at lunch, and he said, so Surinder, your politics, you know, your views, and I said, Philip, I've got lots of friends in Labour, Lib Dems, Conservatives. I don't do politics. And he said, fair enough. And he's a, he's a great guy. Uh, and about six months later, um, I went with a friend uh, to an event. It was a Conservative, uh, the White Wall. Um, yeah. And I got a knock at the, at the Dorchester in London. And I got a tap on the shoulder from behind. And it was Philip Hammond. Surinda, I thought you didn't do politics. <laughs> I said, Philip, 
I don't do politics. I'm here with Lord Fink, Stanley Fink, who's a very dear friend. I'm only here as his guest. And he smiled and we moved on. And, you know, so I've got friends everywhere. I just don't, I mean, to be honest with you, even if I'm voting today or tomorrow, yeah. I like to vote for the actual people uh, and their policies. Then the parties come after. So I'm really more into, so if today I thought Tony Blair is the best PM or the best leader, he'd be the one I'd be voting for if I Because you, you vote on what, where are we right now as a UK and what needs to be done to get us to where we need to be, rather than voting on political lines. Absolutely, absolutely. So there's a great reliance on the integrity that you have on the individual, rather than the, you know, I th which is, should be the common sense thing to do, but unfortunately common sense isn't very common nowadays, is it? Yeah, so you just don't get emotional about these things. You, th you think and you want to do what you think, what you believe in the right thing, or the right person to back, or the right uh, party, because it shouldn't have to be where there's, is it yellow, red, blue, you know, I'm going to vote for them. So I'll vote yeah, for them. Well, well, let's get on our rapid fire round so we can finish this through. Um, so a couple of quick questions for you. Obviously, as people of Indian origin, our tagline is that uh, we're everywhere. Which country would you be surprised to find a person of Indian origin in? <laughs> well, this is um, a question I, I'll tell you. In 19, I joined British Airways in 77 as a junior clerk. Yeah. I used to play hockey with and I used to captain the hockey team. And in 78, I remember going to, uh, there, used to there used to be a, a, an inter-airline hockey tournament for all the airlines around the world. Used yeah. to have a bit like the World Cup. This was the airline hockey team. And I went to, flew to New York and the tournament was held in New Jersey, uh, a small, small town in the middle of nowhere called Port Jarvis. So I'm talking about now 78. Uh, so that's what, 42 years ago. Was it, for, whatever, yeah, 42 years ago. And on the second night in the hotel, uh, we're sitting in the bar having a drink and there was a, a Sikh gentleman, uh, Sardarji, with a turban who was there with his family drinking in the hotel. And he was a local guy. I remember ringing up my brother uh, from there the next day or whenever, and I said, uh, VG, you won't believe that we're in the middle of nowhere on the planet, and I've met a Sikh gentleman. Yeah. And my brother's got a bit of a sense of humor, and he said, uh, Surinder, it doesn't matter which corner of the world you go to, you will find an Indian and potatoes everywhere. <laughs> sarcastic comment but he said so Indians are everywhere so uh, I think you know, it's always nice when you do meet fellow countrymen fellow Asian fellow friends but is there any country in particular that you'd be surprised to find us in because I, I remember when I spoke to Lord Rami we've got a strong community in Argentina for example big Punjabi community there um, he was he was talking about some of the countries in Asia but what about you where would you be shocked to find us in do you know, personally, I wouldn't be shocked anywhere, but if you said to me where the least, I think, yeah. that would be probably uh, places like, I don't know, uh, Hawaii. Now, I've never been, but if I went there, do I think I'll actually meet, uh, I, I'd be surprised that I won't see many Asians, but I could be wrong. I, I can see a documentary coming up where we take surrender to Hawaii. <laughs> to meet the community. Okay, then what's the one piece of advice that you wish you did not take? Well, you know where I mentioned earlier, uh, the back in 99 when I opened my first ever hotel and a very dear friend, a very experienced city senior uh, English guy, a good friend of mine, we used to work together in British Airways and he said to me, uh, the words I used earlier about the banks will always be there with an umbrella over your head. Be careful. So I wish I'd listened to his words carefully. And that's what could have nearly sunk us back in 2008, 9, 10. Um, but I've always said in life, you know, that you cannot. And the one thing every time I face challenges, I always in my head, 
I've always got the valleys and hills and I'm always down in the valleys and I'm pushing myself up and that's what always gets me top of the hill. So I think where, you know, people, you know, think, well, I'm a winner when I'm on top of the hill. I don't really see that. I think well, that's an advice that you wish you did take. What's one piece of advice that you wish you did not take? Uh, oh, that was my, in my younger days that I did, uh, uh, you know, when I was buying and selling little houses, and I, I remember in Hayes, I, I sold a couple of houses, and someone said to me, oh, put money into Euro Disney, they're going to be doing well, and, you know, I bought shares at over £12, I put all my, in those days, £100,000 into Euro Disney shares, and I, I bought them at £11, £12 a share, and they went up to 14 or £15, and this friend, the same friend said to me, no, no, don't do anything yet, because I thought, should I sell them? No, don't do it yet. Wait till Euro Disney opens and they'll go through the roof. Well, they went the other way and I ended up selling them for £1.25 each. So I got a tenth of my money back. A life lesson in itself, right? I don't really do stocks and shares, although I've just recently just started playing a little bit. But yeah, I've stayed away from them for nearly 30 years. That's fantastic. Um, final one, which global Indian around the globe do you look up at that you find fascinating? Oh my God. <laughs> do you know that there are, genuinely, there are so many. I so know, and, and if we were a diplomatic show, I'd let you say 10, but since we're not, which is that one? Person, to be honest with you, I've got, when I say Indian, I've got two, but I've got an Indian and an English, but the Indian one I would say, uh, a gentleman, uh, I don't know whether you've, I'm sure you might have heard of, K.P. Singh, uh, who, from DLF. Yeah. Uh, now, here's a gentleman who has built up probably one of the biggest, probably the biggest property developer in India. Yeah. And I met him, I was blessed to meet him. You know, we met the first time, um, around about 2004, so about 16, 17 years ago. And for the first couple of years, he's so down to earth, so humble. Forget all the toys in life and, you know, the helicopters and private jets and the, but he was so down, he's so down to earth. For the first couple of years, I did not even know who he was. And it was only when he invited us to India to play golf at his golf club in Delhi and again so down to earth and then you realize what kind of guy this is and five days after that trip we were back at the airport uh, and the Forbes rich list had just come out the worldwide Forbes list and I was in the lounge at uh, Delhi airport I'll never forget this he still we didn't I didn't know who he, you know I knew he was very well lovely guy down to earth and on the front page of India Times, his picture, the front page, the world's richest property tycoon. And, you know, he's someone I've always looked upon. I always respect, call him uncle, dear uncle. And last year it was his 90th birthday celebrated. We only spoke a couple of days ago. And when we play golf, he still walks the golf course. I mean, you know, if you're going to learn from someone and, you know, People like Sanjay, my son, and others can learn from yeah. hero, people like that. Incredible gentleman. What an incredible conversation. I'm sure you agree. I suppose, as you would know, with Surinder, not only is he incredibly humble, but also his tips for life, remaining grounded, actually understanding where your identity comes from. It's piles of wisdom that go past generation to generation. They're evergreen in their own selves. And I suppose the other element of this is the fact that hard work does pay off. The fact that he is a positive opportunist. I suppose if there is a benefit of the world of finance and understanding more about the independence that one achieves, it's the fact that that is available to everybody. Just exactly what he said at the beginning. Now, regardless of any isms that we may throw at ourselves, is always possible. Well, on that note, I really hope you enjoyed the session and do take care until next week where we once more plunge 
into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin. Take care for now.